Hello guys, once again it's Matt and today we have another video. So today we are taking out a little bit of information on the F-111, the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark, or the Earth Pig apparently. <laughs> so yeah, today we are going to be diving down on the F-111. Let's thank our members over landing 11B and COTS for being the full crew members, all the FOXPAM members, all the FISHPAM members, and let's get into it. Make sure to subscribe. And yeah, so another episode finally for the uh, Diving Down series, I know you guys love this series. So we are going to talk a little bit of in its, its history of the F-111, after that the design performance of the aircraft, the variants that existed, and finally what variants should come to War Thunder in my opinion. This is not a confirmation that they are coming, it's just uh, some rumor and not a rumor but just um, some information about the aircraft and stuff so that when it's added you can have some information about it so yeah a very cool aircraft i love this type of interdictor aircraft it has a very similar um objective than the tornado ids so yeah a lot of countries developed these type of aircraft so we have the f-111 for the us for the uk italy and germany we have the tornado and for the USSR we have the Su-24 but obviously we have the Mirage 2000D afterwards and a lot of other countries used this type of uh, line of thinking you know uh, because as I'm going to say because especially because of more modern AA systems it made strategic bombers and long-range bombers uh, that fly in high altitudes kind of obsolete and yeah the Soviets had the MiG-25 and then later the MiG-31, they had very modern systems, so the NATO countries were trying to get this type of uh, aircraft that are going to fly low and fast to deliver uh, nuclear bombs, you know. That was the main objective, uh, the general idea behind some of these aircraft. And one of them is the General Dynamics F-111 Aardvark. Aardvark means Earth pig apparently in Afghans, I think it's uh, it's called, uh, which is a, a language in South Africa, I think. If I'm mistaken, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, but yeah, it is a supersonic, medium-range, multi-role uh, kind of, you know, aircraft uh, because it has, as as I said, it has a role similar to the tornado and it has many variants, but still. But the main objective is ground attack slash interdictor, and or low altitude strategic bombing, you know, nuclear bombing and stuff like that. But it was also used for reconnaissance and electronic warfare, okay? The name, as I said, means Earth Peak, uh, and the long nose, uh, they basically name it because it has a long nose and a low level terrain following, so it is like uh, close to the ground, you know? And in even in Australian service, he got the nickname Pig, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, due to the 1960s shutdown of the U-2 spy, spy plane over the Soviet Union, uh, it made basically of all the headlines uh, that the Soviet Union had the S-75, which is the new type of um, long-range or medium-range uh, anti-air uh, uh, surface-to-air missile system, you know. And basically, in the, that era, basically, um, they thought, as I was saying before, that the big line of bombers, uh, like strategic bombers, were less effective if war broke out with the Soviet Union uh, because of these new SAM systems, like the S-75 and later the S-125. And with that idea in mind, they had to like basically fly, fly low to avoid these SAM systems. Uh, the F-105 was basically that, you know, the, the initial idea behind that. Uh, it entered service in their era, you know, in the 60s. It was fast and it could fly low very fast, but it had a problem. It required a long, long, long runway. Uh, as you know, you know the F-105 in War Thunder is complicated to fly sometimes uh, to, to take off. I mean, so yeah, but yeah, uh, but basically because of that, and after NASA actually did some research and made it so that uh, the swing wings were actually possible. The uh, USAF in 1960 uh, issued a specification for a long-range interdictor aircraft to penetrate Soviet air defenses uh, with the objective of flying low, fast and far with swing wings to reduce the landing distances as well. Obviously the same objective that 
the Soviets actually found out as well around the same time. So around the same era that the Americans were developing the F-111, the Soviets were developing the Su-17 and the MiG-23, and later uh, together, basically with the Su-17 and a little bit later, uh, the Su-24 as well. It basically entered in service around the same era, uh, but still. Uh, and the USN was also looking for an aircraft that could be a better interceptor than the F-4 for fleet air defense the, uh, missions. Uh, and after McNamara uh, was appointed as the new Secretary, Secretary of Defense of the United States, uh, he and the team decided to begin a program uh, with the USAF in mind and a modified version for the USN. They loved that idea of having basically the same aircraft with a different version for the US Navy. Okay? Uh, the program was called the TFX or Tactical Fighter Experimental but eventually the Navy and the USAF had efforts separated from each other. The USAF wanted an attending seat, low altitude penetration bomber, as I said before, and the Navy wanted a short, a shorter high altitude uh, side by side seating to allow the pilot to pilot and radar officer to share the radar display. Uh, with some more differences between them and stuff like that, uh, the requirements of G's and stuff like that, for example, for the Navy was uh, less uh, capable than the, for the USAF. F. So basically they had this different type of uh, ideas behind it. But in December 1961 proposals were received by Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed, McDonnell and North American and Republic. Uh, so all proposal proposals were lacking but Boeing, Boeing and General Dynamics were selected to submit enhanced designs, you know, with the Boeing proposal needing a different engine and some other changes, but still, yeah. Both companies provided the updated proposals in April 1962. Uh, the USAF favored the Boeing design uh, and the Navy found them to be, uh, both of them, to be unacceptable, unacceptable for operations. Two more rounds uh, were conducted of proposals and Boeing eventually was picked by the selection board. But, the fun part about politics, <laughs> as always, but in November, in McNamara selected the General Dynamics proposal due to its greater commonality between the USAF and the USN versions. So they needed a cheaper aircraft, basically. That was the idea. Uh, and in that same month, uh, General Dynamics signed the TFX program with a congressional investigation shortly afterwards, but with no change in the selection. Uh, initial uh, versions were to be called the F-111A and the F-111B, being the USAF A. Uh, the USAF would be the A and the B would be for the Navy. Uh, the USAF would have the APQ-113 attack radar, so it was a ground radar, and a terrain following radar, the APQ-110, uh, with autopilot system integrated to that. And for the B variant, for the Navy, uh, and for ground armament, of course, for the A, right? And for the B, it was supposed to use the AUG-9 radar, the same radar as in the F-14, and the AIM-54 missiles that we already know and love. Uh, both sitting side by side, uh, the crew, basically. Led by Robert H. Widmer, uh, the chief engineer, apparently, from General Dynamics, uh, with the team of General Dynamics as well, uh, not having uh, too much experience in the naval carrier carrier-based aircraft designs, you know, Grumman was called to help in the assembly of the B, but Grumman would help in the A's fuselage as well. It was a complex aircraft with many new techs like variable geometry wings, uh, the turbofan engines uh, being the TF-30 engine that we see on the F-14 as well. Uh, so it was basically a very, very, very complex aircraft. In September 1963, the mock-up was inspected and the first test of the F-111A was uh, rolled out from General Dynamics Plant 4 in Texas in October 1964, powered by the YTF 30P1 turbofan engine, uh, a new type of engine obviously, that had a, a fan uh, in front of the turbojet, um, similar to more modern jet engines. And he used an ejector seat because uh, of the the escape, uh, the escape capsule was not ready yet. I'm going to talk a little bit about the escape capture. The escape capsule, Jesus, that's a hard word to say as a Brazilian. 
um, it was not ready yet so yeah but still I'm going to talk it uh, about it later they wanted to use escape capsule uh, instead of the normal injection but uh, instead of uh, just the normal ejection okay that was the idea uh, the first flight is in December 1964 and the B was also equip equipped it with the ejector seats uh, and the first flight was in 1965 uh, but with a lot of compressor surges and stalls and stuff like that, they had to redesign the intakes uh, to the engine better ingest the air during 1965 and 6. Uh, F111A achieved Mach 1.3 in February 1965 with some cracks in the wing attach points discovered in 1968. So they were being developed, you know, uh, doing fatigue testing in the ground. Uh, the an F111 even crashed to this problem the next year. And we've had redesigned uh, wing uh, and stuff like that. The flight tests ran until 1973. First initial production aircraft were delivered in 1967, but as I said, something uh, they were changing the design and stuff like that, and doing a lot of different versions and stuff like that. So just keep that in mind that even though they were entering in service, they had to be made. Uh, a lot of upgrades due to some problems with the wing cracks, you know. Uh, with missions, even in Vietnam, they were used in Vietnam, in many, many, many wars with many, many variants, you know, uh, with the operators being just the US and Australia. Uh, the F-111B was cancelled in 1968 due to weight and performance issues, especially in dogfights, along for additional requirements that the Navy needed, okay. Many variants were made and we are going to talk about it later. Uh, but yeah, the production ended in 1976 with 563 F-111 made. You know, F like I said, the versions I'm going to talk it it, I'll, about it later. Okay, uh, the design and the performance of the aircraft was uh, basically the F-111 was a uh, all-weather attack aircraft. That was the main objective. Uh, of course, uh, low-level penetration of enemy air defenses, as I said before, to deliver ordnance on the target with variable geometry wings and an internal weapons bay. Okay, the cockpit was side by side, not in thunding like the F-14, for example, uh, and the cockpit itself was an escape crew capsule. So basically, because of the low speed, uh, the low altitude and high speed uh, capabilities of these aircraft and the objective of flying in these type of conditions, they made that the whole cockpit was uh, basically a escape capsule, you know, and not that the aircraft, the, the pilots were, were to eject from the aircraft. That a very interesting thing, I'm showing some pictures and yeah, it's just a very weird design, but interesting, right? Uh, the wing sweep would go from 16 degrees to 72.5 degrees. It has slats, a double slotted flaps over the full length of the wing. Um, it is, uh, the, the aircraft itself is mostly made out of aluminium alloys, alloys uh, with steel, titanium and other materials obviously being used too in some places. It has a semi monocoque fuselage with a honeycomb skin or basically a honeycomb structure. Uh, on the outer skin of the aircraft, you know, um, it has a three-point landing gear, obviously, and with the landing gear door even even being used as an air air brake, which is kind of fun, <laughs> different design and a very smart design actually. Uh, with most F-111 having terrain following radar connected to an autopilot, basically it means that the aircraft could fly at around 60 meters from the ground with the pilot's hands off. Uh, basically a very similar system from the Tornado uh, and I think the Su-24 uh, Su also has the, uh, a similar uh, um, design but still a very interesting and very scary stuff if you are a pilot, you know, you to trust the aircraft. Uh, the engines were two parting with an TF-30 turbofan engines with afterburners, uh, so the same engine as we see in the F-14. Uh, so they are not the greatest range in ever initially, but they were upgraded to be better along the line, along the, the, the service life. Uh, basically the design of it, obviously as I said, uh, it has the weapons bay. With the internal bay, uh, it was uh, basically made to carry bombs, but it also could carry a removable 20mm N61 Vulcan cannon, or even more fuel if you wanted to. So in-game it could have the cannon, uh, which is fun and nice. 
Uh, for bombs, the bay could carry only two M117s, uh, 750-pound bombs, or one nuclear bomb. So it was not the biggest thing ever, but still. Uh, yeah, with the F-111B carrying the M54s there as well. Uh, the cannon had an amazing 2,084, uh, 2084 rounds, so it's amazing, uh, with a fairing in the muzzle, but it was rarely used in the F-111s. But it can be in the game. I mean, we have the 25mm uh, Aiden in the Harrier Gear 7, so there's no need to not have the gun in game as well. Uh, the F-111C and F could carry the AVQ-26 uh, Pave uh, PaveTech um, targeting system on a rotating carriage inside the weapons bay, as I said, with flare and with uh, thermals, laser rangefinder and designator, so these versions could actually uh, designate uh, laser guided bombs, you know. And the Australian RF-111C used our reconnaissance equipment as well in that weapons bay. With the FP-111, that I'm going to talk a bit about it later, uh, basically it was able to carry two AGM-69 SRAM uh, nuclear missiles, so it was made for that, you know, so yeah. Uh, with General Dynamics trying to put M9s on the bay as well, but it was never adopted. And early F-111s could use the M7s uh, in there too, uh, due to the radar being capable of doing that, but it was never fitted too. So, maybe we'll see M7s? Maybe, you know, technically it is possible in some versions, but it was never used, so they probably test the air, maybe even didn't didn't even test it, but I don't know, it's hard to find information about this specific thing, uh, but maybe it could be added, <laughs> so interesting, right? For the external ordnance, uh, it has four underwing pylons each wing, two inner ones uh, with a rotating mechanism so that it is parallel to the aircraft while the, the wings uh, sweep, just like the Su-24 has. And the two outer ones don't have that, okay? Each pylon was able to carry 2,300 kilograms of force, uh, of ordnance, which is a lot. So bombs, rockets, anything that the US had. Uh, fuel tanks too, if you wanted to. Uh, two pods could be added under the fuselage too, uh, for ECM and data link, or anything like that. And since the outer pylons were fixed, practically it wasn't able to use its full capability, a capacity of bombs most of the time because uh, the outer pylons were fixed, not uh, rotating. So they basically could not carry a lot of things there, you know, or the aircraft would be um, limited to a certain way of flying. Why did they do that? I don't know. I really don't understand. Probably some technical problem, but still. It could carry four M9s on the inner pylons, you know, and the F-111 uh, could carry the Harpoon missile and the Popeye missile as well. Uh, it was technically the first production aircraft to use variable geometry wings, but it's kind of debatable that, because, as I said, they were being developed in the late 60s while they were being produced. So, yeah, technically yes, but these dates don't matter too much. So, anyway, yeah. Uh, and the Navy decided in the end of the development, uh, in, this, in the late 60s basically decided to go with the F-14 instead of the F-111. It was way better than the F-111 uh, for that role that they wanted to. Uh, the performance itself of the aircraft uh, with the F model being used as an example, uh, that used the TF-30P 100 engine with 112 kilonewtons each, a max speed of 2,656 kilometers per hour at altitude and 1,472 at sea level around Mach 2.5 at altitude and 1.1, 1 uh, 1.2 uh, around sea level. It had around 6,000 kilometers of uh, range with a surface ceiling of 20,000 meters uh, and a max G around of 7.33. The rate of climb was around 131 meters per second, so not the greatest, but it doesn't need a lot of climbing. <laughs> and the empty, empty weight uh, was around 21,000 um, kilograms. So it's a very heavy aircraft, if you think about it. It could use basically any bomb or rocket that the US had, including in some models the laser guided stuff, as I said. Um, cluster, depending on the version, uh, nuclear, napalm, anti-runway ammunition, stuff like that, okay? 
so yeah this is the history the design and the performance of the aircraft an amazing aircraft very fast as you see 2.5 is a very fast aircraft but it depends on the version as well and with that in mind let's talk about its variants so it has basically let me count there's like nine variants of it technically ten but I'm not including some prototypes and different things like that but still first of all we have obviously the F-111A uh, which is the initial production for the USAF most A models use the improved TF-30P3 uh, it had uh, 82 kN inch in afterburner had the APQ-113 attack radar as I said before with the APQ-110 terrain following radar with inertial navigation system which is a very modern system for that time uh, with hands-off flying at low altitudes down to 61 meters so very scary 159 of them were built with three production aircraft uh, being the uh, later just added for the normal production with some upgrades and 42 of them were converted to EF 111A's which is the Raven which is a electronic warfare variant that we're going to talk about at the end of the variant part so yeah after that uh, or together with that they did the F 111B which was the USN version the fleet air defense variant carrier capable to defend against bombers and long-range Soviet missiles uh, having troubles in dogfights and being a bit overweight to the USN taste uh, it was tested with seven aircraft but it never entered in full service uh, it was substituted uh, the, the idea was substituted for the F-14 Tomcat used the AUG-9 radar and the Phoenix missile with the P-3 T uh, the TF-30 P-3 variant of the engine so the same engine as the F-111A uh, then after that the F-111C an export variant for the uh, For Australia, okay, so it's basically an F-111A uh, With the longer wings that the B had and a strengthened uh, FB-111A uh, gear so we had the gear from the uh, Strategic bomber version that we're going to talk a little bit about later uh, some of them were converted for reconnaissance mission and in the 90s it was upgraded with more modern systems as well so it was a very cool aircraft and we can see it as a premium or an event vehicle or something like that uh, after the initial variant um, the a of course we had the f-111d upgraded from the f-111a it had better engines better avionics early form of a glass cockpit uh, it was delivered from 1970 until 1973 with 96 of them were built and a more powerful TF-30 P9 engine um, with better systems like the attack radar and a better APQ-128 terrain following radar it had even a MTI mode on the radar and a normal mode for guiding um, Sparrow missiles if you wanted to uh, but it never carried them in service but we can see that in, in War Thunder maybe I don't know uh, but it had its problems with especially by reliability with the um, avionics you know it had many bugs and problems with that uh, due to being a very complex system back in the day you know it's a very complex uh, it had I mean early forms of glass cockpits it had a very early version of a, a train following radar so it was a very very complex aircraft for the time it was a like a a fifth gen aircraft today think about them looking at these aircraft back in the day you know you see this aircraft as a old bomber but Back in the day, this thing was the top of the top of the technology. So, yeah, it's like a B2 today, kind of, you know. So, yeah. Uh, then we have the F-111E, a simplified version of the D. Uh, used the same uh, P3 engines from the A and a Mark I uh, avionics. Uh, some people said it, it was like it was bad because it was all analog, you know, uh, just like the A. But at least it worked uh, because the D had a lot of problems with that. It was delivered around 1969 until 1971. Some upgrades were made over the years for the E, uh, for its avionics and stuff like that. So it was just a simplified version of the D, like the MiG 27K and the M, right? Uh, F 111F, uh, final variant of the F 111, basically the final variant. Uh, it had modern avionics uh, for, for the time, less, is less, less expensive, had the Mark IIB avionics, uh, the F-111D had the Mark II which had a lot of problems 
and they fixed those problems on the F with the Mark II B avionics. Uh, I had the TF30 P100 engine was a very very good engine with 112 kilonewtons of power, so it, it's a very strong engine. Uh, it had a simplified version of the radar on the FP-111A, which is the strategic bomber one that we are going to talk about. And the production didn't have the MTI mode, but it could be possible to... I mean, it was tested, but it wasn't added for the production model. So, remember, the D and the F... Technically, it could, they could have, I mean, the D had it, but the F could have it, but it didn't. Uh, an MTI mode for guiding missiles, so pretty interesting, right? Um, it had a 35% increase in power, so it was a very, very good engine that he used, with adjustable engine nozzles for fuel consumption, and the engines were upgraded in 1984 for the P109 standard. Uh, don't know how much power he gained, but still. In early 80s, he got even the FLIR system, uh, the AVQ-26 PaveTrack, pave tech or PaveTrack uh, that I said before, uh, which had a laser designator uh, for use on the guided bomb. So the Mark 82, 84, so the GBU-12 and the GBU-24 could be used on it. With very early MFD systems, but very cool ones as well being added to, right? Final version, it was replaced by the F-15E in 1996. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, after, I mean, then we have some other different variants. So these are the normal variants that we see. And then we have some other def different types of variants. So we, we have the F-111K, which was basically a prototype similar to the D variant, but a little bit simplified and uh, some other stuff was changed uh, for the British government, but it was recalled and never saw full service. Uh, maybe as a premium, I don't know. Uh, and then the FB-111A, or later called the F-111G, was the strategic bomber version. Uh, I had the Mark II B avionics from the F, um, capable of delivering nuclear bombs and missiles, and with some modifications done to it, uh, and some prototypes made for modernization and stuff like that. Uh, but after the B-1B Lancer, actually uh, entered in service he not he didn't sell saw service these more modern versions you know uh, so yeah so the fb 111a was basically an f 111f that could carry nuclear bombs and the f 111g is just a more modern version of that uh, for avionics and stuff the ef 111 i mean the fb 111a was basically a f an f 111a that was to deliver nuclear weapons and the f 111g was basically a f an f 111f they could carry nuclear weapons. It's kind of like that, you know. And then the final version, we have the EF-111A. Basically, uh, it's called the Raven. And it's basically an electronic warfare version of the F-111A. Uh, replacing the EB-66 uh, as an F-111A, you know. Uh, it had ECM and jamming and highly modern jamming and stuff like that. Uh, it just had no armament, you know, just jamming. It was used in the Gulf War, I think. And it was a very, very good aircraft in its job, but it doesn't carry any weapons, so we won't probably see in game. Okay? And then uh, the final part of the video the variants that should come to War Thunder. So I think obviously the main operator obviously will be the US. Uh, so the USA, after the 105, we can get the F 111A. I think it should become uh, the, the first variant, similar to the Tornado GR1 initially, you know. So we would not have any type of guided bombs or anything like that. It was just going to be um, able to carry the AIM-9s for protecting itself and just normal non-guided bombs, you know. So And the cannon, obviously. So after the 105, as I said, and after that, uh, we can see a version that maybe it's... N I, I don't know, maybe we can go directly to the F-111F. But uh, maybe we can see the F-111D in the middle uh, ground between the modern stuff. But it's not that different, so I don't think it should be added. Uh, in my opinion, I think we should go directly to the F-111F, uh, which would make a very different aircraft from the A. So we would have the laser-guided stuff and more advanced radars and stuff like that. The only thing that I... I think about the F-111D would be that it could carry technically the Sparrow missile and that would be fun. So maybe between those two they can add the F-111D, but I don't know, it then it's kind of an opinion matter, you know. I think we should go from the A directly to the F, but because of the Sparrow, 
maybe we should see the, the D variant just for the sake of it. Uh, and then, um, an as an event vehicle, we should see, or an, a premium or something like that, the F-111B. I think he, in the future, not right now, maybe, uh, but I think it should be added. I mean, it had seven, uh, seven prototypes built, basically, uh, but they never saw service, so it's not fair to actually add it as a, as a line vehicle, you know. Uh, to be honest, the US doesn't need it, uh, but as an event vehicle, you would be nice, uh, a carrier based with the Phoenix, with the AUG-9, it would be kind of a lower BR, you know, than an F-14A, for example, uh, but it's still, it's going to be very, very fun to use Phoenixes, and it could carry the A-9s as well, so it would be very, very fun as an event vehicle. And then uh, we have the other nation that might be able to use these aircraft, so technically the UK, you know, uh, could carry the F-111C, which is the, the Australian version, maybe as a premium, or maybe as a, a line vehicle, you know, I don't know, the British have a lot of bombers in that area, so, and even the Tornado, so I don't think it's needed, but maybe as a premium or an event vehicle for the UK. Or even for the USA as well, the F-111C, I mean, we have already the M1A1 from Australia in the USA, so it would make sense to have uh, the F-111C there considering it's an American aircraft. So, uh, considering the M1 is there, the Australian Australian M1 is there, uh, the F-111C should be there as well. So, probably in the US as an, a premium or event vehicle as well, uh, but then it's maybe too much, you know, because two F-111s as premiums or event vehicles, I don't know. Uh, I still prefer the B if you're going to get one of these. But yeah, this is my opinion, obviously, and all the other things is not, but still. Uh, so yeah, basically this is it. Let me know in the comments what you think about the F-111. Uh, the F-111 was voted as the, the most wanted aircraft uh, for the Diving Down series video this week. So for next week video I'm going to do the Su-24, okay? Uh, it was uh, less voted, so the F-111 came first, and then the Su-24 next week. Okay, guys? So, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in the comments what you think about the Aardvark, an amazing aircraft, and I really hope we should get it very, very soon. Hopefully in the next patch or in the upcoming patches. And subscribe, be a member if you want to help the channel, and I see you guys on the next one. So, bye guys. See ya.